putting first, first. That is our theme for the year of 2022. Want to have God be first place in our lives and everything that goes along with that and what it means. He wants first place. So we'll look at that together. But first, let's take his word in hand. Let's stand together, dear ones, as we make this powerful declaration concerning his word. This is my Bible. It is the incomparable, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I choose to live as it calls me to live. I am open and ready to receive from God's living Word. And I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. Now, Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. It is the first of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the section that we're talking about in chapter 6 is actually right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus gave this incredible sermon that gives his Magna Carta his great charter. This is what his kingdom's about. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, we're going to come back to that, so you're going to want to keep your finger there. But we're going to put your fingers to work for a few minutes as well, because I'm going to ask you to text me. And I'm going to ask you to text me and tell me, what does it mean to put God first? You tell me. What does that mean to you? I say, God needs to be first in your life. What does that mean to you? How do you do that? How do you live that out? How do you put God first in your life? Text me at 920-256-256. 3077. We'll chat about that because that's actually going to be the first part of what I'm going to share is what you have to say about putting God first in your life and how you do that, what it means to you. But first, I, as you're texting me that, I, I should just tell you about this guy. Like your pastor, he's a little hard of hearing. And he goes to the doctor, and the doctor gives him some stern advice. And the next day, the doctor sees him out on the town. He's got his shirt buttoned halfway down, and he's just strutting along like nobody's business, and he's got himself a young chick on his arm. And the doctor goes up and says, what are you doing? And the guy says, well, doctor, I'm just following your advice. You said, get a hot mama and be cheerful. The doctor says, I didn't say that. I said, you have a heart murmur. Be careful. (laughs) Some people don't listen too good. And one of the problems we can have is we don't hear what God wants to speak into our lives. We're going to try really hard to make sure we listen and put God first. Our theme for 2022 is first. It's what God wants for our lives. And let's take a look at your replies What does it mean to put God first? The first one that says, reading my devotional first in the morning or listening to devotional on my way to work and going to church, praying. Okay, good. This one says, everything you say, think, and do honors the Lord. Good. Another one says, starting every morning, ending every day with God and focusing on his will for my life versus my will for my life. This says, I'm not sure right now. This one says, to live how God would want us to, to love him and to love others. I like that. This one says, doing devotions completely every day. This one says, reading the word daily, edifying other people and seeking the lost. That's some good stuff, isn't it? During first service, we had a few people that texted in and said, it means to me, WWJD. What would Jesus do? 
That's what I need to think. What would Jesus do in each situation and circumstance that I come across? How would he have me live? What would he have me to do? How would he have me to react? Hmm, I like that. Well, we've got some good thoughts there on what it means to put God first. And so we're going to take and think a little more on that. Part number two, I want to talk about putting God first. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. Matthew 6, verse 33. Now, when it says to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seek first instead of what? Instead of what? Well, that's in the context right here. Let's take a look. We can go all the way back to verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry. Actually, go back to 24. 24 says, nobody can serve two masters. You'll either love one and hate the other or else be loyal to one, despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon being money, material things. You can't serve God and be a materialist. That doesn't mean that God has any problem with you having possessions. God does have a problem with possessions having you. You understand the difference? Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat, what you're going to drink, what about your body, what are you going to put on. Life is more than food in the body, more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, they don't gather into barns. Yet your Father, Heavenly Father, feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you worrying can add one cubit to your stature. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore don't worry saying, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? <sighs> all the material stuff, right? After all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly fathers know what you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about its own. Sufficient to the day is what you're dealing with. Matthew 6.33, you put God first, He's going to help take care of everything else in your life. When you put the right priority in the right place, everything else starts lining up. To put God first is going to put him above everything and everyone. To put God first doesn't mean that you neglect everything and everyone. It means you have the right priorities of God is above everyone and everything. He's got first place within your life. If God is first place, that doesn't mean you don't have to work. That would be wrong. Of course you should work. God works. Work is not a four-letter word. Okay, it is a four-letter word, but it's not a bad four-letter word. Love is a four-letter word, and work is what God did, and work is not part of the fall God gave men and women work to do before the fall. God works. He invites us to do it. But God doesn't want your focus on your work. He doesn't want your focus on material things. He wants you to focus on him and prioritize him first. A little bit more that Jesus talks about this we find in Matthew 22. Flip over to that. Now, we've recently dealt with these verses. If you remember, we had our big Ten Commandments on both sides, and the first of the four commandments dealt with our relationship with God, and the last six commandments dealt with our relationship with people. And when asked the question in Matthew chapter number 22, and we're going to answer with verse 37, the question came up in verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? What's the first commandment? 
What's the most important commandment? What's the greatest priority, if you will? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. You're going to love God. That's the first and most important commandment. He says the second is like the first. You're going to love others as you love yourself. It comes back and calls us back into a healthy relationship of love. So we seek God first and his kingdom, his kingdom stuff first. We love God first and we prioritize him first. Now, that's what we're called to do. But there's a little bit of a problem. We can slip up on that. Because let's face it, life gets busy. Other things jockey for position. Other things clamor for our attention. And we can end up very similar to the church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. So take your Bible now, and we're going to go from the, la- from the first book in the New Testament to the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Now, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is revealing who Jesus is in his glorified state, and it is also Jesus revealing to us what we need to know about our relationship with him and future events that are pertinent to that. But in chapter number two, it starts with one of the seven letters that Jesus told the apostle John to write. And he says, starting at chapter two, verse one, to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. As we saw in chapter number one, that's Jesus walking in the midst of the churches. He says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. You cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who are apostles and are not and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for thy name's sake and have not become weary. Dude, that is awesome, isn't it? They are working hard. They are patient. They are persevering. They are discerning. That is so cool. But it doesn't end there. Verse number four, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now that can happen. It can happen when you you start to take things for granted and you just get caught up in life and all of the busyness of it. And at the time that Jesus is speaking this to the Apostle John, it is the end of the first century. It's more than 60 years since Jesus ascended. And now it's now the second generation. The second generation. People that had not seen Jesus in person. People that maybe didn't get the chance to personally meet apostles. This is now the second generation. And for some of them, even though they're doing the right things, they don't have the passion. Things have become more or less religion rather than relationship. And Jesus is saying, I want you back in relationship with me. I want you back in love with me. I want to be your first love. You're doing all these good things, but I want to be your first love. I want to be your affection, your everything, your attention. I want you to be the passion in your life. I want you to have it directed at me. I want you to be so close to me. You've left your first love. So what does he tell them to do? Verse number five, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Remember from where you've fallen. What did you used to do? When you first fell in love with Jesus, when you first experienced, wow, he's forgiven me. He forgave me for everything. It's like, wow, I love you. And you worshiped him, didn't you? 
You just poured out. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for worship. I just worship you because you have been so good to me and gracious to me. You forgave me for everything. You just expressed your love in worship. Is your worship passionate or is your worship just kind of not passionate? He says, remember from where you've fallen. What did you used to do? I, I fell in love with this word. I wanted to read the scriptures. I wanted to know him. I wanted to know about his love for me. I wanted to know about his plans for me. I was hungry for his word from where I have fallen. He says, and what do you do? Verse 5, he says, remember from where you've fallen, repent. That means turn around, change your mind. It's time to get things in the right direction. Repent and do the first works. Get back to where you were with God when you were passionate, when you had him as your first love. Get back to where you need to be. He says, or else, or else, there is an or else here, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from his place unless you repent. That's pretty serious, isn't it? I don't want him to remove our lampstand. I don't want him to remove his presence from our church. I don't want to be a YMCA with a steeple on the top. I don't want to just be a recreational place of fellowship. I want to be a place where the presence and the power of God is real. I'm, I want that. I know you want that. What do we have to do to have that? We've got to get back to our first love. We've got to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. We need to get back to seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and putting him number one within our lives, putting God first. William Law said this, if you have not chosen the kingdom of God first, it will in the end make no difference what you have chosen instead. We need God first, don't we? We need to him have first place. So let's, let's do it. Let's put him first. Let's, let's go back to where we have fallen from. Let's go back and do the first works, the first things. Let's go back to putting him first within our lives. And if you remember, that's going to start with putting him the priority in your life every single day, and that's devotions. That's making sure when you start your day, you get up and the first thing you do is acknowledge God. Lord, thank you. Good morning. And if you're not a morning person, I, I didn't used to be a morning person. It was, oh, good Lord, it's morning. You need to fix that and you need to say, good morning, Lord, and put your focus. Today is your day. Help me wake up. Help me live for you. Help me honor you. It takes less than 10 seconds to say that. Put your focus on him to start your day. Start your day with the priorities of putting God first in your life. Now, I'm going to ask you to do daily devotions. And I'm going to ask you to do it with me. I'm going to ask us all to do it together. And you received a sheet this morning. If you didn't, you can slip a hand up. And we'll be happy to give you one. It says, the New Testament daily devotional one-year schedule. Everybody got one of those? If you did not get one of those, slip a hand up, and one of our wonderful ushers will bring you one. Everybody got one? Wonderful. Okay. You don't have that sheet? We need one for up here, please. We want you to have this, because what this is, is this is breaking down the entire New Testament, which is 287 chapters, and it's going to break them up into 365 readings. Some days you will read an entire chapter. Some days you'll only read half of a chapter, a portion. Some days a third of a chapter, because some chapters are really long. But it's going to break it up into 365 days, and it will be based upon what we have shared together, and many of you already have, the 100 days through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospel. Synoptic means to view together. 
Matthew, Mark, and Luke in 100 days, and the Gospel of John in 40 days. So 140 out of our 365 days, we will go through the Gospels together. Now, I know many of you already have these, which is wonderful. I have some available and more that are arriving this week so that if you don't have a copy, you can get a copy, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But I want you to be on track with us. I want you to commit to being on track with us every single day, and we're all going to go through reading the New Testament through together. And with that synchronization, we are going to see the Holy Spirit do some beautiful things within our lives. Now, there are different ways that you can do it in going through this. You have the schedule. You can take the schedule and you can just read the passage of Scripture and enjoy the Scripture and then pray. We're going to want to walk through that. You can also use my devotionals. But let's take and let's just go to the schedule and let's go to Matthew chapter 1. Go to Matthew chapter 1. And I want you to see just how easy this is. Even though this is a challenging chapter as far as it's got a lot of names in. But I'm going to pull my phone out here, put on the timer, and I'm going to put it onto the stopwatch. And I am going to time how long it's going to take you and I to read through Matthew chapter 1. Are you ready? Read it out loud with me as we get ready to read Matthew 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon. Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Salmon, or Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot King David, or David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah. Abijah begot Asa. Asa begot Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat begot Joram. Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And when they had brought, been brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel begot Abiud, Abiud begot Eliakim, Eliakim begot Azor, Azor begot Zadok, Zadok begot Achim, Achim begot Eliud, Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot Nathan, and Nathan begot Jacob. Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David till the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon till Christ are 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from his sleep by the angel of the Lord, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. Two minutes and 53 seconds. Now you might read it slower. It might take you three minutes and 30 seconds. Have you got three or four minutes for God? I, th I think you, you can do that, can't you? 
an average of about three minutes a day, you will be able to read the entire New Testament all the way through. And then, and then what do we do? Well, part of devotions is I read, and then I pray. What well, should you pray? Commit your way to the Lord. Jesus, I just give you today. I just commit my life to you, this year to you. Lead me, guide me, direct me. Have your way in my life. Help me to be more like you. Help me to love people the way you love them. That's what I want. Show me today anything you want me to know and how you want me to live. Commit your way to him. What did that take? 22 seconds. That's it. Now, you can pray longer. You can pray for your family, your friends. You can ask God concerning specific situations. Maybe you'll go for two minutes, and you'll have spent five minutes doing devotions. You can do that, can't you? Say, I can do that. Say that. I can do that. Yeah, Yeah, you can. I believe you can do that. Now, if you say, well, it's only five minutes. I I can give God a little more than that. Well, if you want to, I have some help for you. As I shared with you before, you can also use my devotionals if you wish. You can take the devotional 100 days through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I have a page that is there for you, which is basically... Matthew chapter number one, the commentary and the devotional for today. The commentaries on the first portion, the, the devotionals on the back. Now, if we look at this devotional, this devotional, I'm going to read it for you. It takes approximately two minutes and 20 seconds. Can you imagine what Joseph must have thought? Your fiance tells you she's pregnant. You wonder. How could she be so unfaithful to you? And who the scoundrel was? But not only does she tell you that she hasn't been with another man, she tells you God did it. Did Mary really expect Joseph to buy that line? He apparently didn't because he was going to put her away or break off the engagement. I appreciate that. Why would someone appreciate Joseph's doubt? Well, consider how Joseph came to believe. He had a dream where an angel convinces him that Mary's story was true and that he should not be afraid to marry her. A a skeptic might sneer and say that such visions or dreams were nothing more than the result of a bad meal and a bad dream. But this dream was so powerful that it changed Joseph's mind. This convinces me that it had to be a revelation from God. A simple tradesman. That was Joseph. A carpenter in a little town people wouldn't think twice about. Yet the Heavenly Father chose him to be stepdad to God's son. Imagine that. Then imagine this. Joseph taught Jesus, the creator of the universe, how to be a carpenter. I bet there were some very special times shared in that workshop in Nazareth. I like Joseph. You know, If God can use a simple carpenter from a small town, maybe he could use you and me. Think about it. Better yet, pray about it. The devotional takes you just a couple minutes if you want. And then if you have questions about any of the verses, you have a commentary that takes you verse by verse through and helps you understand those passages of Scripture. I will make this available for you. And if you buy this online at Amazon, I believe it's $25.99 or something like that. And this one is like 16 I think. If you're here at church, I can't ship them out for this, but I can do this. I have some copies left, and both of them together, price is $20 for both of them together. And if I'm sold out, which is very likely I will be, I have sitting in the back of the sanctuary on the steel table, I have days two through seven available for you. So you can get copy two through seven, or you can just try out and see how it works for you for the week. Sample it in days two through seven. And these are available for you online as well. So if you want to download them, you'll see the links online there for you so you can download them as well and participate that way. So you can try it out for a week, and I will have additional copies available next week. So it can be the commentary, 
It can be just reading the scripture. It can be just the devotional with the scripture and praying. I'm asking you to put God first in every single day in 2022. Join me in daily devotions. Next Sunday, here's going to ask the question. Simple question. I'm going to ask you next Sunday, did you do devotions every single day this last week? That's what I'm going to ask you. And I'm hoping you're going to come back and say, yes, we did it. I'm asking you to be faithful, to put God first all throughout this year. The sample's available for you there. And now you need to know you are officially on track because you and I just read Matthew chapter 1, right? That was for New Year's Day. That was yesterday. You're already on track. So all you need to do now is when you get home, read Matthew chapter 2. So that's your assignment for today. Read Matthew chapter 2. If you would like, you can go through the devotional on Matthew chapter 2 and or the commentary as well, if you wish. But now you have your assignment, and you're on track, and you're going to make it happen. Will you do it? Yes. Oh, that was weak. <laughs> you weren't ready for me. I'll, I'll give you that. Will you do it? Yes. All right. We'll do it together. And we'll see great things as we do it together. Now I want to close with this note for you. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 comes with an incredible promise. If you will put God first, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's his righteousness? Well, that's doing the right things, right? That's doing what he wants you to do. That's doing what you're doing right here. You're being in church together. Putting God first on the first day of the week. You're at church Make sure you're at, you, every Sunday, every Sunday be with us. Every Sunday, put God first, his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and do the right things. And what? Everything else will be added to you. A.W. Tozer, looking at this, made this simple statement. As God is exalted to the right place in our lives, a thousand problems are solved all at once. Stand with me as we close. God's ready to solve a thousand problems within your life. Things that you have struggled with. Troubles that have faced you. Addictions that have held you. Struggles that have drained you. God is ready to solve them if you will put God first. And we're going to pray just that. Would you bow your heads, please? And in an action of surrender, because we are going to surrender, I would encourage you to lift your hands up like you like your hands up. I, I surrender. And pray right out loud with me and say, Dear Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. You already gave your life for me. You paid it all on the cross. Took all of my sin and all of my suffering, and all of my shame, and I am coming to you, surrendering my life to you, everything I am, everything I have, I give my life to you, and I am putting you first place, first in my life. You will be my priority. Every single day, I'm going to prioritize you. I'm going to be faithful, faithful in devotions, faithful to church, faithful to honor you, and I will have your help. I know I have your help. Have your way in my life that you might be pleased and that I might be the person you want. And bless me as I am. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, dear ones. For those of you that have shared these moments online to our other campuses, God bless you. Looking forward to sharing this year together with you. If you would like, I have just a few copies left of the devotional books. I will have them in the back if you want to pick some up today. Otherwise, if you want, you can pick up the samples of days two through seven. I love you. God bless you. You are dismissed.